So I'm delighted to welcome you to the 2024 DFCM conference. I'm Alison Merbaum. I'm the Faculty Development Program Director in the Department of Family and Community Medicine and the Chair of the Conference Planning Committee. Today, we bring you a full day composed of plenary sessions, research presentations, interactive workshops, and poster sessions, as well as opportunity for rekindling old friendships, meeting new colleagues, and forging new collaborations. We're here today at Beanfield Centre on the grounds of Exhibition Place and just across from the shores of Lake Ontario. Throughout history, the waterfront of Lake Ontario has been vitally important to various peoples, including the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabeg, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. However, this ended abruptly in 1787 when the, Brit when the British colonial government purchased 250,000 uh, acres of land on the north shore of Lake Ontario from the Mississaugas for 10 shillings, the equivalent of $60. This became the site of York, the capital of Upper Canada. This has been referred to as the Toronto Purchase. In 1986, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation made a claim that the Toronto Purchase was fraudulent and that the Crown had failed its two major duties. Number one, to ensure the River Credit Mississaugas were fully informed as to their rights and the facts regarding any particular transaction. And two, to ensure that the Crown had paid a reasonable price for surrendered land. The claim was settled for $145 million in 2010. In 2017, in partnership with the Mississaugas of the New Credit, First Nation, the Trillium Park Moccasin Identifier Project was launched. Trillium Park being located just on the other side of Lakeshore Drive. The objective of this project is to advance treaty and Indigenous awareness by covering Canada in moccasins. Serving as both a public art initiative as well as part of education curriculum, Stencils of traditional moccasins from various Indigenous communities have been drawn to raise awareness of the indigeneity of the land. There's a carving of a large Anishinaabe moccasin on the granite wall face that marks the entrance into the park, done by Philip Cote, a renowned artist from Moose Deer First, uh, Point First Nation. Just beside this uh, building is Inukshuk Park. The 30-foot high granite stone Inukshuk, shown in the photo here, is one of the largest of its kind in North America and was designed by internationally acclaimed Inuit artist Kelly Palik Kimmerpik, who hails from Nunavut. Inukshuks are often found in the Arctic landscape and are intended as a navigational tool for travelers on land and sea, but they also signify to travelers that they're not alone, that someone has previously stood where they're standing. When the statue was unveiled in 2002 to commemorate World Youth Day, it was said that the Toronto Inukshuk invites each one of us to become beacons of light and hope, striving for justice and peace in this world. This message speaks to me of allyship, a message that I think rings true more now than ever. Anne Bishop, in her book On Becoming an Ally, Breaking the Cycle of Oppression in People, defines an ally as someone who recognizes the unearned privilege they receive from society's patterns of injustice and takes responsibility for changing these patterns. She also speaks of the qualities of an ally, including being self-reflective, recognizing our own experiences of oppression, and using this to recognize and address oppression faced by other groups. We as family physicians and health professional educators are by nature lifelong learners. And being an ally relies on willingness to stay informed and to be open to new ideas and perspectives. It also means listening to others' experiences. And I would also posit that listening is something that we do very well as primary care clinicians. And finally, speaking up when we witness discrimination, harassment, or injustice. Many thanks to my colleague and friend, Thea Weisdorf, who let me know that today is Moose Hide Campaign Day, where Canadians are invited to take a stand against gender-based violence. We're reminded that four in 10 women in Canada will experience intimate partner violence in their lifetime, with the rates for Indigenous women being three times higher uh, than for other women. Importantly, Indigenous women and girls are 12 times more likely to be murdered or missing than any other women in Canada. Events for the Moosehide campaign include a sunrise ceremony that took place early this morning, the walk to end violence uh, taking place in Victoria, BC at noon Pacific Standard Time, and the fast to end violence, which of course may be difficult to participate in while attending the conference today with the delicious food put on by our caterers at Beanfield Center. 
Amongst the goals of their campaign, which include creating safe workplaces, supporting reconciliation, and promoting cultural sensitivity and anti-racism, they also endeavor to encourage healthy masculinity, which they denote as helping to guide men and boys in developing healthy behaviors and concepts of masculinity. The moose hide pin that I'm wearing today is intended as a commitment to honor, respect, and protect the women and children in our lives, and work to end gender-based violence in Canada. For more information on this campaign, please visit their website. Moving into some housekeeping and information about the day ahead, here's a visual of our venue, uh, our event space here today. So you'll see we're here in room uh, 206 C and D. Beside us just to the right are the posters in room two, uh, 206 A and B. Um, there's an opportunity to take photos uh, with a big DFCM banner over there. So if groups from different sites want to take sort of a group photo, uh, you'll find that in 206 A and B. Uh, as well, we uh, are excited to have a photographer here between about 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. who's going to be taking headshots. So for anyone who's looking to update their headshot for academic purposes, um, please uh, pop over to room uh, 206 A and B sometime between 10 and 3, and our photographer will be happy to take that at no cost, and it'll be emailed to you afterwards. Uh, our workshops will be taking place all around the corridors of this floor, and you can find your workshop room number on your name badge. Uh, so this is the agenda for the day. Um, so very shortly, we're going to have our uh, Walter Rosser lecture, followed by uh, a break in time to uh, view the poster presentations. Uh, we're going to move into our morning workshops from 10.45 till 12 p.m., uh, we'll have our lunch break at 12 p.m., and lunch is going to be served as a buffet uh, in the main corridor. You can either bring your lunch back here, or I'll tell you about some other options in just a moment. Uh, and please note that we'll be bringing you back a few minutes early from lunch at 12.55 for a special video presentation. Unfortunately, our former chair, Dr. Michael Kidd, had hoped to join us in person today, but had a loss in the family and was unable to travel here. He sent us a lovely video greeting and we'll share it with you just before kicking off our afternoon plenary session. During lunchtime, you'll have a few options. So lunch will be served as a buffet in the main hallway. You can bring it back here and mingle with friends and colleagues. As an additional option, um, the groups that are shown here will be hosting networking tables in room, two, excuse me, in room 200. So please consider visiting with them. As well, after you eat, you can stroll through the posters next door. An event like this would not be possible without the tremendous support of so many from our DFCM community. My sincere thanks to members of our conference planning committee, uh, DFCM staff who've contributed their time to assist us here today, our faculty facilitators for each of the oral paper sessions, uh, and our abstract vetting committee who helped to choose from among the many workshop submissions to bring you a broad and diverse selection of scholarly presentations that highlight so many areas um, that our DFCM uh, faculty and learners uh, have, have spent their time and energy putting together. Uh, there are three team members uh, that I really wanted to personally highlight. Uh, we're so lucky that Brian De Silva and his team, including Matthew and Julio, um, from the Med IT program at the Temerty Faculty of Medicine are here to help support our live stream and recording of our event today. Amy Noyes, the DFCM Senior Communications Strategist, has been instrumental in all of the planning and dissemination of today's event. We can always depend on her innovative ideas to ensure we bring uh, something fresh yet relevant every year. And Danielle Dudica, I'm hoping is in the room, um, the faculty development program and conference administrator whose incredible work ethic, organizational skills, and detailed orientedness is second to none in my book. And thank you for all you do, Danielle. <laughs> and without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce the chair of our department, Dr. Danielle Martin, to share her greetings. Thanks so much, Allison. It's such a joy to see uh, all of the smiling faces um, 
here. And speaking of smiling, uh, Jack Westfall and I have mutually agreed that friends don't let friends walk around with green juice in their teeth. So please keep that in mind as you enjoy the tremendously delicious uh, breakfast um, and, uh, and lunch that have been organized by the wonderful conference team. I'm, I'm really only going to say a few uh, uh, brief words of welcome uh, and to thank all of you for taking the time to come together today. I do think these uh, days are really important. Uh, the opportunity that they provide all of us to, uh, to reconnect uh, and to celebrate all of the excellent work uh, that is underway in this department. Uh, the theme, of course, of today is family medicine, what matters most. Uh, and uh, of course, it's hard to really um, narrow down the list, it feels, at this moment in family medicine in the province of Ontario and in our country. The list of things that matter most um, feels almost impossible to prioritize. And it can be overwhelming and difficult as we think about the many frustrations and challenges in our work. It can be hard to remember that actually we are doing the work. We are engaged as a department. Each of you is here because you are engaged in trying to move forward on the things uh, that matter most. And I've been thinking about uh, this concept a lot of uh, being able to hold two apparently contradictory yet true things at once, um, something that I think we all experience in our clinical lives as family physicians on a regular basis that we can uh, and that we must at this moment in our discipline hold to be true both that it's an incredibly challenging time and uh, also that it's a time full of hope and opportunity. Uh, I wrote in the last uh, DFCM newsletter a little bit about this concept and shared um, a, a notion that I keep coming back to as we struggle to figure out <clears throat> how we can address the reality that 2.2 million people in this province don't have a family physician and that even those who are connected uh, to our wonderful practices can still sometimes have difficulty accessing care uh, and that our own faculty members and community-based family doctors are often struggling to reconnect with their joy in work. Um, but I, came back, I keep coming back to these words of uh, the well-known community organizer and now a professor at the Kennedy School of Government, uh, Marshall Gans, who says that if you want to make positive change in the world, it is much more important to be clear on what you are fighting for than what you are fighting against. And I think that days like today are important moments uh, for us to reconnect with what we are working for. Uh, we're working for a system in which every person, including all of us, our loved ones, our family members, and all of the people who live in our communities are attached to a responsive and high quality primary care team. And uh, we're working for a system in which every primary care team is designed in partnership with its community. In other words, a system that meets the needs of communities and patients and that also supports the health professionals who work in it. And of course, there's no way to know what kind of system is gonna meet the needs of our patients unless we ask them. And so I just want to give a huge uh, shout out and acknowledgement to the patient partners in the room today. We've been working very hard in our department to amplify the voices of the people we serve in our work. And uh, we're gonna be hearing about practice and community-based uh, research in our first keynote of the day. And Jack, I know we're all really looking forward to that. Um, whether it's the community partnerships work that Melanie Henry is leading in uh, community health centers, whether it's the launch of UpLearn, our new practice and community-based learning and research network led by Dr. Andrew Pinto, whether it's the many faculty members who've been working on our annual family medicine uh, report, which uh, the, the stories were selected by our patients, uh, or the Addiction Week con conference, the patient education materials, like we have really increased the engagement of patients and families in the work of our department. It was a commitment we made in our strategic plan. Um, and I wanna uh, just say thank you very much to the patients and family members who participate and to all those of you who've had to rethink how you do your work to make that important space for those voices. Uh, before I hand over to Peter Selby, our Vice Chair of Research, who's going to introduce our keynote, I just want to uh, once again take a moment to thank our, uh, our uh, wonderful leaders who organized today. A special big thanks to Alison Murbaum for her 
tremendous leadership of the committee uh, that organizes this conference um, and uh, up to and including pivoting at the very last second around the, uh, around the schedule. We're really grateful to you, Allison, for your leadership. And of course, Danielle Dudica, who uh, has already received a shout out, but always deserves another. And a huge thank you uh, because all of this, of course, happens under the auspices of the leadership of Risa Freeman, our Vice Chair Education and Scholarship, uh, who leads our education portfolio. Uh, it takes a community to build a day like this, and uh, I just want to say in that spirit, maybe try to think about having lunch with someone that you don't know that well today and uh, moving around tables and, and connecting with new colleagues. We have medical students here today. We have uh, all kinds of folks who need to be welcomed into the wonderful community that is DFCM so that we can leave today uh, with our eyes fully focused uh, on the future of family medicine in our department. And with that, I'll hand over to you, Peter.